Turn with me, please, to First John. We're continuing in First John. First John, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you the eternal life, which was with the Father and which was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that ye may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full, or be made full. Notice, first of all, the parallel, the similarity between the introductory chapters of John's Gospel and what we see here. First, it describes Jesus as the light. It describes him very much in the character of the way he's presented in John's Gospel, chapter 1. We have the term beginning, and arche, or it would be in Breshit in the underlying Hebrew and Aramaic thought, and that he's a witness to it. He's physically seen it. He's physically been in contact with Jesus, and... He goes on this way about bearing witness and speaking of the light. Then he goes on and he picks up speaking about things we see in John's Gospel, chapters 14 to 16, the relationship within the Godhead between the three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So 1 John chapter 1 is emphatically written by the same author, he is saying the same things using the same kind of terminology he uses in the gospel. And then he picks it up towards the end of the gospel where it talks about, again, the relationship within the Godhead and how that, in turn, applies to us and our relationship with God. So looking at verse 1, Ho en ap arkes ho Akeomenon, ho herokamen, tuis aptalmos, hemon ho estelemina, kaihe keres, hemon epsalfanesan, peritu logo tes zoe. That which was original or from the beginning, we heard, we saw it, we were viewers, we physically were viewers of it. And uh, we looked with gazing, we looked with gazing, and our hands actually stroked or touched about or concerning, Petty, the word of life. Now, here is where we get the concept. It's talking about Jesus, but it describes him as the incarnate Logos. The idea that I often repeat, the scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is the scripture incarnate, the incarnate logos, the incarnate Devar Adonai. Jesus is the scripture in print. The scripture uh, is Jesus in print. Jesus is the scripture, sorry, incarnate. There is no distinction between the word and the word. They are hypostatically united. They are one, one substance. Now, how do we understand this? This tells us a great deal about scripture. Jesus was fully human and fully divine. He's God in the personhood of man. He's God in the personhood of man. He's not 50-50 like the Greek concept of the God-man-redeemer, Hercules, the son of Zeus, who was 50% human and 50% divine. Jesus is 100% divine 
and 100% human. Okay. Now, with this, we have the word, the logos description. We talk about the first epistle of John or the gospel of John. Is that the word of John or is it the word of God? Is it the word of John or is it the word of God? Is it the word of the human author, the inspired human agency, or is it the word of the inspirer? It's not 50-50. It's 100% and 100%. The scripture is 100% the word of God and 100% the word of man. It is the word of God in the word of man, the same as Jesus is God in man. He is God in man, and the scripture is the word of God in the word of man. It's 100% John, 100% Luke, 100% Isaiah, 100% Moses, but it's 100% God. The same as Jesus is 100% and 100% human and divine. That's the basis. Now we see the centrality of scripture. As we often said, if you love Jesus, you will love his word because there's no distinction. We are told in the Hebrew scriptures that God has magnified his word above his name. He's magnified his word above his name. I remember during the counterfeit revivals of 20-something years ago, there was one religious liar saying that although these things are not scriptural, God is bigger than his word. And he was saying, although these things like people imitating animals and things like this are not in scripture, actually it is in scripture, the mind of an animal was given to Nebuchadnezzar in judgment, but these people in the vineyard movement and Elam in England called it a blessing, God's word called it a curse. But when challenged with these facts, this is not scriptural. I actually had a minister from the Elam movement in England, a Pentecostal church, send me a protest saying, either or toasters or, or microwave ovens in scripture. And they're not wrong. <laughs> God is bigger than his word. How can God be bigger than God? The word was made flesh. Jesus is God. He is the Logos. How can God be bigger than God? It's an absurd statement. Now, this comes from a fundamental either misunderstanding or willful, a willful ignoring of what we read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. 1 John 1, 1. You cannot separate Jesus from his word, you cannot separate Jesus from God. You cannot separate the scripture from the Lord. If you love the Lord, you will love his word. And if you truly love his word, you will love him. God does not make that kind of distinction. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let's continue into verse 2. Get the word epiphany, uh, that which is being manifested. The life, the zoe, was manifested. Now, the term here is not just biological life. In the context, it is speaking of life eternal. That light was the light of men. He's making reference back to the gospel. For we have seen and we are witnessing Mortur omen, we get the word martyr. That is, we are testifying. Uh, now, the, it follows with the word apigalomen. We are messaging. In Greek, ap the, the term apigalomen is etymologically related to the word evangelion, gospel, good news. We are witnessing, we are reporting something. We, we are reporting that which we are witnesses to. Now, we normally think of the word martyrion, martyr, as somebody killed for their beliefs. Well, scripturally, if you're not willing to die for what you believe about Christ, 
if you're not willing to die for what it says in the scripture, you are not a faithful witness. You are not a true witness. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is identified as the faithful and true witness, the faithful and true martyr. He was willing to die for what he said, for what he taught, for the sake of the scriptures he referred to as the word of God. He was willing to die, and he did die. He is the faithful and true witness. We are called to be in the character of Christ, faithful and true witnesses, willing to die for it. Now, this idea of death is not simply death in persecution. It involves that, but that's not what it is alone. In the early church, there were people under the fear of persecution who renounced their faith and then tried to get back in. And it was called superlapsarianism, and it caused a big division in the church. This was particularly a case in North Africa uh, prior to the Islamic invasions. The Romans slaughtered the Christians wholesale, and some of them reverted to paganism and pagan practices and worship in order to save their skin. But after the persecution lifted, they wanted to get back into the church, and it caused a big schism. It caused a big schism known as novationism, and it, it was a big problem. So there is the idea of being willing to be martyred. However, in the greater context, this idea of willing to die, because we have seen him, because we have seen who he is, what he is, because we are witnesses to it, because he is life, we are willing to die to testify to it. That is not only Zoe biologically, but the context of the chapter deals with sin. We must be willing to die to sin, to self, and to the world. An individual Christian, depending on their circumstances, may or may not be called upon to be martyred for their faith in the sense of biologically killed. They may or they may not. There are those who are. They receive a martyr's crown. They have a special status in the millennial reign of Christ. They have a badge of honor for all eternity. They love not their lives in this world, even unto death. They would be sort of somebody who remains in the military in the United States after having received a uh, Congressional Medal of Honor or somebody who remains in the military in Great Britain having received the Victoria Cross. Well, they have a status that's always with them as long as they wear the uniform. These are martyrs. Sometimes they're counted among the men of whom the world is not worthy in Hebrews and so forth. We may or we may not be called to be martyrs, but we are all called, all called to die for what we believe in, in terms of dealing with the old nature, the world, and the devil. Die to self, die to the world, die to the designs of Satan in order that we may live to Christ. If we are not living that way, if we are not battling against the old creation and against the world, we are not morturion, we are not faithful witnesses. There are people who have an intellectual belief, <clears throat> but they're not faithful witnesses. I read something today about a Christian recording artist I don't know anything about, but she appear apparently received high accolades from critical reviews, and her material has sold a lot of copies. Now, remember, the Christian music ministry has become the Christian music industry based in Nashville, Tennessee. It is not necessarily a ministry. It's an industry. It's a business. Most of these secular recording companies, <clears throat> I'm sorry, most of the Christian recording companies are now secularly owned. It's a business. Like you have country music or pop music or <clears throat> jazz music. It's just another kind of music for selling recorded material, and so forth. Well, 
This person was Carrie Underwood. I think her name is Un Un Underwood. She's a singer. And she says that she's a saved Christian. She grew up in an evangelical Bible-believing church, but now she attends a progressive church, a progressive church that accepts same-sex marriage. I'm born again, but I believe in same-sex marriage. She said, I'm not, I'm not called to judge. Well, if the Logos says something, if the Logos says something is morally wrong, distorted, corrupt, that's not you judging. That is something that God has already judged. And if you are not upholding the judgments made by God in Scripture, you are not a faithful witness because you are not a mortiron. You are a religious babbler, but you are not a Christian by biblical definition. Real Christians have to bear witness, maturion, even at the potential cost of their temporal biological life, they must bear witness or they're not real believers. To go along with political correctness, to accept things that God says are fundamentally wrong for the sake of a recording contract or for the sake of uh, being culturally acceptable in a woke culture, whatever you want to say about it. God is not woke. God is not politically correct. God is holy. Yes, God is or Christ is sinner-friendly. He is sinner-friendly, but he is sin-hostile. God is sinner-friendly, sin-hostile. And if we are faithful witness to him, witnesses to him, we will indeed be the same. Let's continue looking at what John tells us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with God the Father and with Christ Jesus. If you stand on what the apostles are teaching about the relationship we have with each other, it is because and derivative from the relationship that we have with the Father through Christ. Real fellowship, real koinonia is the word here in Greek. Real koinonia. Hebrew, different words, hitabrut, shutafut, but here it's koinonia in Greek. It is only possible to have real fellowship with each other if we have fellowship with God through Christ. The vertical relationship with God makes the horizontal relationships with each other automatic. We're all heading in the same direction. We all have the same goal, one faith, one baptism, one destination. We can have fellowship with each other only if we have fellowship with God. If we are out of harmony with the Logos, if our lives are out of harmony with the teaching of Scripture, we are out of fellowship with the Lord. Now, young believers may not know any better. There are people in ignorance may be involved in doing things or believing things they don't know are wrong. But if they are in Christ, the Lord will show them by his spirit, this is wrong. I have seen this a number of times in a number of ways. I was saved through a terrible organization called the Cogs, the Children of God. I actually had a born again experience through it. But the Lord showed me through various ways this was wrong. The gospel was right. The door was right. 
but what was inside the room was wrong. I became involved with another group, terrible organization as it were, called the Forever Family, the Church of Bible Understanding. They renamed themselves. This is in the aftermath of the hippie era. Now, both of these groups were founded by demonized cult leaders, men who became actually demonized, wicked, wicked, twisted men who may have began right. In fact, they, they both did, but were ugly backsliders who came into a position of power as cult leaders, and they became the word of God to these people, not the Logos. Much like the Roman Catholic Church, it is a cult. It is what the Pope, what the magisterium of their so-called church says that's important, not what the scripture says. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Mary says she needs a savior and the Magnificat. That's not important. The Pope says she's sinless, immaculately conceived. Doesn't matter what Mary said or what scripture said. You listen to the leader. Now, as we talked about, 1 John speaks of Antichrist. And Antichrist means in place of Christ. People who teach doctrines that are fundamentally different to the teaching of Scripture have an Antichrist spirit, an Antichrist spirit. Uh, these groups were wrong. They did things the Scripture warns about and warns against, forbidding marriage and all kinds of other stuff. I don't even want to go there. But again, my relationship with Jesus was real. And although I had been in these bad situations and these bad groups, and I was all messed up as a young Christian, all messed up, continually backsliding, and everything was crazy. But I did meet the Lord. And in his grace, by his spirit, he did show me. Now, young believers, out of ignorance, can get caught up in all kinds of things. There are sincere people who've gotten saved in bad churches, including the Roman Catholic Church. But I know many, many believers who were saved while being Roman Catholic, and the Holy Spirit showed them this is false. Get out of it. Now, if people continue to persist in the error, if they continue to follow the error, once Scripture is enlightened to them, then they are not in fellowship with the Lord, and we cannot be in fellowship with them. As it says in Amos, two cannot walk down the same road unless they agree. I can have fellowship with a born-again Roman Catholic. I cannot remain in fellowship with a Roman Catholic who, upon seeing the truth, that it's a false gospel, that his blood cleanses from all sin. We don't atone for our own in purgatory. That praying to the dead is the sin of necromancy. That there is one intercessor, intermediary between God and man. Jesus, not Mary. Once they see these things and they persist in it, they've chosen religion over Christ. I cannot be in fellowship with them. Either can you. It must be on the basis of the Logos, for the Spirit of God to be operational. He will only operate on the basis of Scripture. I'm not deifying the Scripture. The Scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is God in protoplasm. That's the reality. We have to understand the implications of First John. You can't have fellowship with people who don't believe what you do. There can be no koinonia. When I see Christians who are progressivists saying it is okay to have same-sex marriage, I can't be in fellowship with those people because they are out of fellowship with God. 
when you see people doing this, they are either backslidden or they were never saved to begin with. Certainly their churches are backslidden. They're part of the apostate church. We can't have fellowship with these people. Now you find Satan's love lie. Satan's love lie. Just think of the love lie. An older guy gets a younger girl and he wants to seduce her and sleep with her sexually and he tries to persuade her that he loves her and it's all right for her to consensually engage in sex with him because he loves her. Well, if he really loved her, he might want to sleep with her on their honeymoon. <laughs> he might want to consummate a marriage. But if he really loved her, and if he really loved her, he would love her on God's terms. He would not sleep with her before being in holy wedlock. It's the love lie. Oh, I love you so much. Where have you been all my life? I don't know, but I wish you'd go back there. It's the love lie. Oh, but we know wonderful people in the Roman church. And we know wonderful people who go to <clears throat> the vineyard and to IHOP. And... Well, if you love them, pray for them and show them the truth. But if they continue with that stuff, don't talk to me about love. Don't tell me how much they love the Lord because they don't. They don't love the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you wouldn't believe and do those things. The praxis would be doctrinally founded on Scripture. Satan is really good at the love lie. Now, I'm in favor of the love truth. <laughs> but real love depends on the truth. Remember, one of the most important verses we always underscore, highlight, italicize, put in bold print, and amplify. Philippians 1, 9. That your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. If you do not have a doctrinal knowledge of God's word and discernment, you don't have real love. You have emotionally charged religious idiocy masquerading as love. It's based on emotion. It's not based on the Holy Spirit. It's a deception that your love may abound. I want the love of Christ to abound. But that requires knowledge and discernment. Oh, but we should be one. Yes, but again, as we talked about last week, in, the high, in his prayer, high priestly prayer, Jesus prefaced that prayer by saying, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Unity of the spirit depends on true doctrine. You can only be united with people who believe the logos. If people are not following the logos, they are not following Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit is not pointing them to the logos, they're not being pointed to Jesus. It's another spirit. But let's continue looking. Now, having said things like that, verse 4 is interesting. These things were writing to you that the joy of you may have been fulfilled or that your joy may, may be filled. Uh, that's quite a thing. Uh, Pepperomene means having been filled. It's, it's a verb participle, but it's perfect passive nominative. Well, what other scriptures talk about this? Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, Chapter 16.
Notice John says the same thing as epistles that he says it is gospel. He quotes the same thing. Verse 22, therefore, you have grieved now, but when I see you again, you will have joy. No one will take your joy away from you. He also goes on to say that the Holy Spirit will disclose to us what is to come, but he tells us that will be guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit, and our joy is dependent upon this. Unless you have been enlightened by the Holy Spirit to see the truth, you don't have the joy of the Lord. Unless it was, I once was blind, now I see. You don't have the joy of the Lord. John 16 speaks about the joy of the Lord. We see the same thing in John 17, and there's a mention of the joy of the Lord in John chapter 15. And it uses the same term, that your joy may be fulfilled, or that your joy may be full. We have the chorus, this is my commandment that you love one another, that your joy may be full. A joy that no one can take away from you. The joy that is temporal, the joy that comes from other people, that joy can be taken from us. Somebody can be in love with their new wife or their husband and they get flowers on their birthday and chocolate on St. Valentine's Day and all that and happy memories. And then you find out some years later he or she is having an affair. All that previous joy has now been nullified. Somebody can take that joy away. But if a joy is built on Christ, it cannot be taken away. It is impossible to take that joy away. Now, it's interesting that we are told in 1 John that its purpose is joy, to bring us joy. Truth brings joy. And victory over sin brings joy. Well, let's look. He goes back to referring to the creation as he did in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in verse 5. Kaiote estin he agelia, the message, hen akekomen ap otokai. And again, we are messaging again. Human hoti hoteos, vos estin kai scotia, and oto och estin odemia. This is the message we've heard, and that we are messaging, declaring unto you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. There is no darkness at all. Darkness being Scotia. Um, we get Scotland. <laughs> the Romans called it that. Okay. Uh, no darkness at all. We can't fathom that kind of perfection, that kind of total love. There are things that approach it. God gives us hints of it in certain ways that the scripture uses by way of analogy. For instance, when you hold your firstborn baby for the first time, 
That's about as close <laughs> as a human being, particularly if they're a saved Christian, can come to understanding the 100% totality and purity of the love of God. You would die for that baby. In an instant, you would die for that baby, should tragic circumstances require that. It's pure. It's, it's, there's no thought of anything wrong in it. Now, I mentioned this for a reason. We'll come to the reason shortly. Let's look. Verse 7. In the ento foti, peripetomen. If ever yet the light, we may be walking around it or treading. Hos otos esten, as he is, ento foti, in the light, koinoneon, fellowship, ekomen, we are having mit elelon, kaitochema, Jesu Christo to, wio, auto, Catharese, he must apple, pieces, hamartias. If we are walking in his light, the true light that came into the world, because he is light, the light of God that shines in the darkness, we have fellowship with one another, and his blood cleanses from all sin. Yes, a very strong polemic against the lie of Roman Catholicism, against their teaching on purgatory, that you must atone for your own. Remember, the Roman Catholic Church only made the apocryphal books canonical in the Middle Ages. They were held as history and literature by the early Christians, but they were not as canonical basis of doctrine. Why did the Roman Catholic Church do this? Well, had they not done this, in part, the Renaissance that came after it could not have been funded. St. Peter's in Rome, the great cathedrals of Europe, they were funded largely by the sale of indulgences. By denying that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, you must atone for your own in purgatory. But if you give them money or pay money, you can get souls out of purgatory, like dead loved ones, and you can get yourself, get time off for good behavior, the good behavior meaning writing a check, <laughs> so to speak. Tetzel, the Dominican indulgence merchant who Luther heard preach said, uh, when a coin into the box rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Tetzel actually preached the sermon that Luther heard that you could sexually violate Mary, the mother of Christ, and be forgiven if you came up with the right price. That's how the Roman Catholic Church financed the construction projects of the Renaissance. They're all built on this denial of the gospel. Oh, his blood cleanses from all sin. You do not atone for your own. If you witness the Roman Catholics or if you are saved out of Catholicism, please mark verse 7. Please mark verse 7. All means all. Let's look at it again. If we're in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. People who do not walk in the light do not have the assurance of salvation. You see people saying things and doing th We accept gay-friendly, you know, same-sex marriage. We're not called to judge this, this. They're not walking in the light. Such people who live that way, they reject the logos. And they do not have the assurance of salvation unless they repent. the efficacy of his blood to cleanse from sin depends on walking in the light. 
He who follows him will not walk in darkness. Those who make a profession of faith and continue to walk in darkness, such people are false brethren, false brethren. They're either backslidden or were never saved to begin with. They have no assurance of salvation. They're not walking in the light. His blood does not cleanse them from their sin unless they come into the light. Let's continue. Verse 8. Now it gets interesting. Ian Ipomen Hoti Hamartian Ok Ekoman Yetos Plenomen Kai He Elefia Ok Estin and Heman. The Greek grammar here is a little bit complicated. If ever we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, the word here for sin is, again, hamartian, hamartian, and it is a Greek translation of the Hebrew idea of chet, of missing the mark. There are sins of omission and commission. Here we have a translational dilemma. Various translators into other languages, and we're speaking about English now, have tried as best they can to explain the different Greek and Hebrew words for sin by coming up with an English equivalent. Iniquity, trespass, tres uh, transgression. These are honest efforts, but translation is not always an exact science. In fact, it's as much an art as it is a science. It is not precise, to the point where we can ignore or don't need to understand the original meaning of the original languages. Again, I point to Nehemiah 8.8. 8. I point to Nehemiah 8.8. 8. Now, this is important. There is a reason that the New Testament, when quoting the Old, normally follows the Septuagint. It is because the Septuagint is translated from older more original Hebrew manuscripts than the Masoretic text, the Masoretic text being the basic Old Testament text upon which the King James is translated from. The Masoretic is the main one, but the Septuagint is based on older Hebrew manuscripts, and you can see why the New Testament normally follows the Septuagint. It is more faithful to the original meaning. Now, again, this is a whole other subject in itself, but let's begin to understand this. There is a concept of sin. In Hebrew, it is called akash, akash, meaning to no, in order to distort, to distort, or to pervert. In Greek, it is called parabasis, para next to what is its substance, parabasis, akash. And this idea is something that brings, in Hebrew, called abon, abon, a specific divine judgment for doing it. Patabasis, or this akash, has to do with an inner, inner iniquity that perverts God's order, something that distorts God's order. God's order is evident in nature. 
according to Romans 1. God's order is evident in nature. Let's look at examples of patabasis, patabasis or akash. The ancient world, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, they worshipped planets. They associated planets with God. However, nature will tell you that their planets, somebody had to create them. How can they be the creator? This is a distortion. Romans 1 also deals with sexuality. Natural reason tells us that sexuality is heterosexual by God's design. When you see churches like Underwoods and these other ones accommodating things that the scripture says are parabasis, this is apostasy. This is complete apostasy. They distort that which is natural. Another example is non-therapeutic abortion. Non-therapeutic abortion. It is unnatural for a woman to want to kill her baby. In order for that to happen, parabasis must take place. Now this word parabasis is an interesting one. It means to distort by stretching, by stretching. You can have a, a sock that elast has elasticity, okay? And the sock is, is elastic and it will stick to the ankles properly. But if you overstretch it, it won't fit right. It'll begin drooping down into your shoes or your trainers. It's just not good. You have stretched something out of its designed form. The scriptural concept of perverting something means to stretch it out of its designed form. He made them male and female. You stretch it out of its divine form. You look for other orifices of penetration instead of conventional marital copulation and so forth. And then it, it becomes heterosexual and it goes from heterosexual to homosexual and all this other ugly stuff. I'm not trying to be gross. Well, in both Hebrew and Greek, ironically, both, perversion means to stretch, to stretch. You stretch it out of what it's supposed to be. Well, if it's that, we can stretch it out to be this. No. <laughs> if you stretch something out of its design, it no longer functions the way it was designed. The socks will not cling to your ankles. The elasticity will be gone. It won't work. If you do that with human sexuality, it won't work. Now, let's go further. This idea takes two forms in the Greek language, diestrefo and metastrefo. Diestrefo means to be morally corrupted, to be morally corrupted. Metastrefo means to transmute or corrupt by transmuting. Something can begin with moral corruption, diestrefo, but eventually it'll go to metastrefo. When it goes to metastrefo, you've got a problem. Diestrefo, you corrupt something. You fundamentally corrupt something morally. But if you do that long enough and you no longer say it's morally wrong, it's not a sin, it's, it's socially acceptable. 
you will go into metastrefo. You will transmute it. Well, you just look at the LGBTQ, whatever it is. This is transmutation. You stretch the natural design to the point it becomes dysfunctional. Then you accept it as normative. And then ultimately, you transmute it. This past week, I read two cases in the news on the internet. Well, I'll just name, name one of them. A prisoner on death row in California, a murderer, claimed the right to have gender reassignment surgery paid for by the taxpayers of California. This is a guy on death row, a murderer. He, he took an innocent life. And the state of California agreed. He had the right at the expense of the taxpayer to have this gender reassignment surgery, which cannot reassign the gender. It cannot change the chromosomes. It's just an anatomical re-sculpturing. And the citizens of California had to pay for it. Now, wouldn't it be easier to take this guy out and execute him since he's already capitally sentenced? But no, the taxpayers have to fund his sex change. Then he says, now he has the legal right to be sent to a woman's prison. <laughs> it's in woman's prison. On death row, there may be more of a reluctance to execute a woman than a man for murder. So he'll spend more time on death row and live a longer life as a claimed woman than he would as a male, possibly. Because he says, I'm a woman, and I'm in a woman's prison, and you have to legally treat me as a woman. <laughs> this is absurd. Well, this is what happens when you have metastrefo. It becomes transmuted. Good becomes evil. Evil becomes good. The whole reasoning, the premise becomes convoluted. The premise becomes convoluted. Now, when this takes place, when you have a gross patabasis, this will always be characterized by a defiance of the natural order, a defiance of the natural structure. Quite a thing. But that's what we're dealing with. Very ugly. But let's continue. Now, if ever we may be saying in, in, in the beginning of the verse, or if we say that we have no sin, this is subjunctive mood, the subjunctive mood in Greek. The subjunctive mood means uncertainty. It means it is a theoretical possibility. It could happen, but it's a matter of reasonable doubt. It is theoretically possible that people who profess to be Christians, and it says if we say, if ever, Apelman, we may be saying that we are not missing the mark, not sinning. We are deceiving now, this becomes complicated in the Greek grammar, where hiatus plenamen, it is an active first-person plural indicative mood, but it's active. It is, presents a, a bit of a complication to understand because it would normally be, if it was something... In, in the simple past called aorist, 
it would be middle voice, middle voice. Middle voice means the person who performs the action is the recipient of it. The subject who performs the action is the object of it. In Hebrew, it's called the reflexive, like uh, to get dressed. The person who performs the action is the recipient of the action, okay? Now, in a simple era or a simple past tense, or in the future tense, this would be middle voice. But here it is active voice. It means that people who are doing it, the truth is not in them. The truth is not in them. Well, why do I point this out? It's subjunctive mood means it's doubtful it will happen. Yes, it's doubtful it will happen among true believers walking in the light. But it warns us that there are people who deceive themselves, who are not in the truth, yet profess to be Christians. There are people who profess to be Christians, who are not walking in truth, but they deceive themselves. Now, again, it is not a middle voice. It is an active voice. It's an ongoing action. It's not something they did. I was misled. I tricked myself. I thought she really loved me. I thought he really loved me. I thought I was doing the right thing. I wanted to believe it, so I believed it, but now I realize it's not that. This is active voice. It's something ongoing. People who do not walk in doctrinal truth are not walking in the light. People who are not walking in doctrinal truth are not just deceived. They are not just self-deceived. They are willfully deceived. Jesus made this distinction in dealing with the religious establishment of his day. They were not just blind in John chapter 9 and 10. They were willfully blind. I came that the blind may see, and I came that those who see will become blind. That kid in John 9 was born blind. He had no choice. That's a uh, corporate solidarity of fallen man. We are born spiritually blind. Same as a baby is born biologically blind, and it takes a bit of time for the baby to see, and it sees the light. God uses that to teach us about second birth. We are spiritually blind until we begin to see the light, Jesus being the true light that comes into the world. We have no choice about being born blind. Man has fallen. <laughs> but once we see the light, that's different. The Pharisees knew. He spoke the parable about them, it says. Being blind is one thing. That's the human condition. It evokes the compassion of God unto salvation. Being willfully blind is something else. When you see people in willful blindness, they are not just deceived. They are not just deceiving themselves. They're in rebellion. They do not walk in the light. Now let's come down to verse 9. Ian homologumen Apo 
I once told the story, I don't know if I told it to you, dear people, that there is a uh, Greek-speaking church of Greek immigrants, Greek and Cypriot immigrants in Melbourne, Australia. And I have some friends who go to that church and I am occasionally invited to speak there. However, this church is interesting. If you speak English, they will translate you into Greek. If you speak Greek, they will translate you into English. But you must preach or expound the scriptures from the Greek text or the Septuagint if it's the Old Testament. Well, I once had a message from the Lord and I brought the message to this church where I was invited to speak from the Greek text. And at the end of the message, the people in the church were on the floor weeping. I thought that the Holy Spirit used it to bring a conviction of sin. I quickly found out they were on the floor crying because my Greek pronunciation was so bad. <laughs> Bear with me. That's the problem with Bible colleges and seminaries. They only teach you how to read, not how to speak. Well, let's look. If we confess our sin, now this is conditional. If we confess our sin, the sins, that is the missing or the falling short of what God expects, Estin, he, God, is faithful, pistos, of us for what we did. And he may be pardoning, or actually, Epi, he may be from letting. Understand what it's saying. When we say we are granted a pardon for our sins because Christ died for them, that is a true statement. But the Greek idea of Afi means he lets us off. He lets us off. It's like if a cop nails somebody and he's a benevolent officer and he looks at the person and the circumstances and he says, look, I should, I, I, I should lock you up, but, you know, look, don't let this happen again. If it happens again, can't help you. We're going through with a prosecution, but I'm not going to charge you. <laughs> I'm going to let you off. I'm going to let go of this. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? We are all caught guilty. We are all caught guilty. But in salvation, it's not that we are pronounced justified because of Christ simply. It means we don't get indicted or arraigned. We don't get indicted or arraigned. We're not up for trial. The charge is not brought against us if we acknowledge that we did it. If we acknowledge we're guilty and we did it, the charge is not even brought against us. But for those who will not acknowledge it, there is an indictment. The charge is brought against them. They will face a divine arraignment. They are under indictment. They are going to trial. Jesus was already put on trial for what we did. He was already arrested. Remember the garden. Let these go. Take me. <laughs> Don't arrest these. Just take me. The just for the unjust. It doesn't mean that we've been indicted, arraigned. We're facing trial. But we're going to get off 
It means God does not charge us. Jesus was charged for what we did. We were not arrested to begin with. Let these go. Only Jesus was arrested in the garden. Or the woman at the well, uh, sorry, the woman in John 8. She did it. She was caught in the act of doing it. He lets her off. He lets her off. Just think of a cop who nails somebody for breaking the law, even seriously. But he sees something in the person that they may change. And the hope that they may change, he doesn't go through with the arrest. Even though legally he has the means and the grounds and the authority to do so. what we did providing we confess we did it yes officer I did it now if you don't confess it <laughs> you're going to jail <laughs> only this jail is a lot worse than San Quentin it's a lot worse than Alcatraz it's a lot worse than Sing Sing. It's a lot worse than Soledad. <laughs> it's a lot worse than Dartmoor. It's a bad place. Who wants to go there? Nobody in their right mind wants to go there, but a lot of people will. Now, we're not only talking about the unsaved. We are Reading, if we, if we, if we, it is a warning to Christians. The apostate church places itself in peril. Yeah, they got off, but they're not going to get off a second time. They must repent. Let's continue. If we do, he cleanses us from unrighteousness. Now, verse 10. Ian epomenen hoti och hemotekemen susten polomen. Oton kai ho logos auto hoc estin en heman. If we might be saying that we have not missed the mark or have not sinned, and so estin, um, the falsifier, liar, we are making him and the word of him is not in us. People who say that they have not missed the mark are not only liars, they are calling God a liar. All have sinned all fall short of the glory of God. Now, I have no problem applying this to unsaved people. I never sinned, went to church every Sunday. I never stole anything. I never killed anybody. I'm not a sinner. Blessed are the poor in spirit. If you don't know, you're spiritually impoverished and bankrupt. If you don't know you have sin, you can't be forgiven for it. The acceptance, the indictment of the whole, or the conviction, the um, eclenctal in Greek of the Holy Spirit, 
is absolutely essential. It's indispensable to getting saved. Unsaved people must know they have sin before they can get saved. They must understand law before they understand grace, as Ray Comfort put it. Be that as it may, this is not primarily talking about unsaved people. It's warning us. If ever, Apelman, second aorist, active, first person, plural. If we may be saying that, that we haven't missed the mark. When Paul says, wicked man that I am, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the, the law incites me. Is he talking about his pre-Christian life or his post-Christian life? I'm quite convinced he's talking about both. Both. We all have our struggles. I'm no different than any other person. I've got my struggles. Again, I'm not trying to be gross, but I am trying to be honest. I uh, have been set completely free from chemical addictions. Um, the drug abuse of my youth, the Lord has taken that away. I don't get tempted to do that stuff. Uh, I don't even get tempted to smoke cigarettes. Uh, I used to smoke two packs of no filters a day. None of that stuff tempts me. I'm not saying I'm, up, I'm above or beyond that temptation, but it doesn't happen. I mean, the Lord has just given me such a complete victory over what had been Satan's stronghold in my life, which was cocaine and other things like cannabis that went with it and so forth. Okay, praise God for that. And I know other people like that. There are other people in Moriel like that. There's a lot of people in Moriel come from drug abusive backgrounds, a lot. And, okay, I mean, on the ministry team itself. Praise God for that. Hey, I don't think there's a day of the week that goes by, and forgive me for sounding crude, where I am not mentally attacked by recollections of past immoral experiences with women who I slept with before I was a Christian. Have I ever had an affair as a Christian? No. No. Am I mentally attacked by, not fantasies now, of things that I actually did and relationships I had before I walked with the Lord? Unfortunately, the answer is yes, going back to my teenage years. I'm not saying I am plagued with it, but I am certainly challenged by it. Stuff goes through your head. Earlier today, I said, no, I fought that off. Lord, get that out of my head. It's wrong. Uh, you know, I, I have certain things I do. Uh, would you want somebody to do that with your sister or your daughter? No. God says, well, don't do it with my daughter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. I battle it. Pick up the cross. But then my wife comes home, and we just had the uh, lockdown restrictions in England lifted today. Not all of them, but most of them. And she was able to go out to the Kofier for a hairstyle and things like that. And she came home and she looked very attractive. And I grabbed my wife and I gave her a big kiss and told her how pretty she was. Okay, well, <laughs> that's good. That's good. But I was still tempted to engage in recollections about things that were wrong. Things that were wrong. If I was with those women now, I should want to tell them the gospel. But this stuff comes in, you know, you did all this. And I'm not talking now about fantasies or the internet porn and all that stupid. That. I'm talking about relationships, things I did. As, as many Christians did before they were Christians. I believe me, I was no Don Juan, but I certainly sowed my wild oats like everyone I know did. I, I, I was not a moral person. And, uh, okay, 
There's the old nature. He's still there. John here is not just warning. Or he's not even mainly speaking about unsaved people. He's speaking about Christians. If ever, again, this is subjunctive. It becomes subjunctive. That we should be saying this. Then, it be, if, it, if it becomes active, if something that is only possible becomes active, and we think that we, ha we haven't done it, <laughs> oh boy, we're making him a liar. Every one of us struggles with this stuff. Every one of us struggles with this stuff. Yes, it is very easy for me and easy for you to address these things to non-believers. It is easy to say these things to unsaved people, to warn them about not walking in the light, to warn them about their sin and about their sinfulness and about the nature of sin. But John is warning Christians that it applies to unsaved people. That's a given. We already know that. That's a given. There's warning believers here. Yet, the purpose of this, the purpose of him writing this, he says, is that our joy may be filled. It is to make us happy. It's to make us happy. Well, how was this happiness in the text conveyed? Again, in the Greek grammar, the subjunctive mood comes into strong play. Comes into strong play. If you're walking in the light, nobody says you won't be tempted. But if you continue walking in the light, this is not likely to happen. But if you stop walking in the light, it can happen. Unsaved people are already deceived. If Christians begin to compromise on things the word of God says wrong, now they are deceived, and they are willfully deceived. I'm not called to judge. If the Bible says it's wrong, God has already judged and you are called to bear witness to the fact he said so. If you don't, you're not walking in the light. If you don't, you are a religious liar. And you are calling God one. It's a difficult circumstance for the faithful church to be in in these days. And I wish I could say it is going to get easier. But there is a joy in it. A joy that no one can keep. When you continue in that light, there is indeed a joy. Now, again, in order to understand this, we have to go back and read John chapters 15, 16, and 17. I mean the Gospel of John, where he talks about your joy being filled or your joy being fulfilled. For instance, in John 15, 11, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. Same thing he says in 1 John chapter 1 in the epistle. Okay. But look how he puts it in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, <laughs> ask what you want. It'll be done for you.
that your joy may be full. Now, the word faith prosperity preachers, of course, corrupt this. They forget about the code texts that say, if we ask according to his will, It'll be given at God's time on God's terms. I, I don't make a doctrine of this by any means, but I would not be surprised if there are things that Christians ask the Lord for now that they've not received in this life, but they will tangibly receive them in the millennial reign of Christ. I really suspect that could be the case. Again, I'm not being dogmatic about it. I'm not teaching it as a doctrine. But I do think it not unlikely that in the millennial reign of Christ, there are things we ask for now that it was not God's purpose to give us now. But he will give it to us. He will keep this. <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to be dogmatic about it, but that is what I'm disposed to think. The joy is always from walking in the light. There's no joy walking in the darkness. I remember as a young believer when I was always backsliding. I'd be out whacking some coke, cocaine and smoking joints with unsaved people. And I knew they were going to hell. And you can talk about the, the rock music and the soul music and you can talk about drugs and talk about sex and talk about radical politics and this. Talk about all that stuff. But when it came to the ultimate thing, the meaning of life, eternity, I knew the truth. I knew they were heading to hell. I knew I had the message to keep them from going there. But how could I possibly do the messaging, as it says in 1 John 1, if I was not walking in the light? I remember being in bed fornicating with women who I'd met in it, wherever. And some of them I actually liked, not just physically. I liked them as people. But they were going to hell. How could I pursue a sexual relationship with this person? Pretending that there was some affection or romance or whatever. Knowing they were going to hell. And I had the message to stop her from going there, but I couldn't tell it to her. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sleeping with her. There are fleeting pleasures of sin, but I had no peace. I was psychologically tormented. And I was spiritually, spiritually in agony. Once you get saved and you know the truth, once you come to the light, <laughs> you can't enjoy the darkness anymore. Unsaved people can enjoy the darkness because it's all they know. Unsaved people can enjoy the darkness. People who have been saved cannot enjoy the darkness. We may lie to ourselves, but it's a lie. There's no joy in it. There's no real gratification in it. It's there. People do it. Unfortunately, Christians do it. But we're not supposed to do it. That's not where the joy is found. The joy is found <coughs> not in, forgive me for saying it, 
recalling past moral experiences with women from my youth <coughs> or things like that. The joy is found holding the woman who I married in Christ. God has joined me together with and telling her she's beautiful and I loved her. <laughs> That's joy. That's a joy nobody can take. Even biological death can't take it. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. It's only a temporary separation. <coughs> it's a joy nobody can take. There's joy and there's pretended joy. The pretended joy is what the scriptures call the fleeting pleasures of sin. The fleeting pleasures of sin. A temporary sense of gratification that the moment it's over, there is only condemnation. What a mess. What a mess. No, there's nobody who backslides who doesn't wind up wishing they hadn't done it. Now, once more, I have no problem pointing these things out about sin and walking in darkness to non-believers. Evangelistically, John says, we have this messaging. We proclaim it. That's the easy bit. Telling unsaved people, okay, can do that. But reminding myself <laughs> every day, you reminding yourself every day, something else. Fellowship. We can have fellowship with each other, even through this horrible means that didn't work well today, technically. We can have fellowship with each other because we have fellowship with God through Christ. But it depends on the logos. If it is not grounded in the logos, it's not the real Jesus, it's not the real Holy Spirit, it's not real fellowship because it's not real truth. This is John 1.1. 1, 1. Again, we have no chapter divisions in the Greek. Lord willing, we will continue with chapter 2 next week. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. And once again, our apologetic regrets for the technical hiccups we had. We began 20 minutes late tonight or this afternoon if you're in the States, and I'm really, really apologetic. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jake. I really appreciate that excellent teaching. Um, got one question here from uh, Amal. He, since you mentioned um, deviant sexuality, he says progressive Christians use Isaiah 56, 4 and 5, as their scripture for LGBTQ acceptance. How can I explain to them they have uh, misunderstood that verse? Oh. Okay, let's read it first. Say it again, Isaiah. It is Isaiah 56, 4 and 5. Okay. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. Okay, so here it's talking about people who are asexual, who are non-sexual, who are sexually dysfunctional. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Female sex hormones, estrogen, are ovarian secretions, require ovaries. They're internal. Males, the male sex hormone, testosterone, is produced externally. Someone cannot 
physiologically function without those chemicals, without those compounds. And it is not just physical, they affect psychological predisposition to sexual interest, okay? The text itself tells us that these people have been sexually neutered. They have no capacity for interest or arousal physiologically. They are incapable of it. It's just not there. Where do you equate a homosexual with a eunuch? Scripture doesn't. Now, you may say transgender people become eunuchs. They do. But if they're so happy, how come they have a 50% suicide rate? <laughs> Why do people who become eunuchs literally eunuchs, emasc surgical emasculation, why do they have a 50%, approximately 50%, some say it's higher, suicide rate? Patabasis, they stretch what is normal. They pervert. Now, additionally, let's go back to the beginning of Isaiah. You can't take something in a book out of the overall context of what the book says. Remember, a text out of context in isolation from co-text is always a pretext. We must read everything in Isaiah in light of everything in Isaiah, but initial emphasis on the prologue, on the beginning. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were already long destroyed in the days of Lot and Abraham. But backslidden Judah began to behave in the same way, much as like what you see today. So what does God say about these people coming to church or, in their day, going to the temple and practicing their religion. He says, you're the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. What? In verse 11, are you multiplied sacrifices to me? I had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no more. Your incense is an abomination to me. Get out of here. I don't want your prayers. I don't sing to him. I don't want your worship. Get out of my house. Chapter 56 must be read in light of chapter 1. Yep. Amen. Um Let's see. Somebody else have a question? Uh, let's see. Andrew, did you have a question? <clears throat> yes, I had a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jacob, for the message today. I, I think the question I had, you mentioned earlier with regards to acknowledging sin in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, right? If we confess our sins, he's, yes. he is willing to forgive us. So, 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 so I think in light of what you just mentioned in Isaiah, I think it goes with saying that if you don't do Teshuvah, if you, if you don't repent, you know, it's one thing to acknowledge your sin, right? Teshuvah is the Hebrew word meaning to turn from sin back towards God. It's the exactly. Hebrew expression for repent. Sorry, people might not know what that means. Go ahead. Yes. So, so if, if you don't do right repentance, if you don't turn away from sin, right, as you just mentioned in Isaiah, right. Uh, God won't even have anything to do with that. It, it, That's it has to do with turning away from sin first, and then obviously correct. having... Uh, Look, God's nobody sin. says transgender people, as they call themselves, and they're really not transgender. They There's only X and Y chromosomes, but whatever they want to call themselves. 
Nobody says the eunuch can't get saved. Nobody says they can't repent and believe. Isaiah 56 says they can. The Lord will forgive them. He is sinner friendly, but he is sin hostile. I would also point out that my drug abuse, my cocaine addiction, and my sexual immorality would have put me in the same hell as their homosexuality or lesbianism. I don't think I'm any better than they are in and of myself. Yeah. Also got to remember that eunuchs were not, that wasn't something they did to themselves. It was something that was done to them. Yeah. <laughs> That they makes tended to be like guards and harems and things like that. Exactly. Because the suzerain did not want anybody fooling around, fooling with, his around. Concubines, with his concubines. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, Leanne, did you have a question? Um, well, I had just posted, and so I was getting a couple private messages. The Deuteronomy 23, one says that eunuchs were not allowed into the house of the Lord. So Isaiah 56 is kind of just talking about after being born again, you'll be allowed in all sinners, everything, whatever, whoever was not once allowed into the house of the Lord is now made righteous and allowed in. Yes. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, Jesus said there are those who are eunuchs for the kingdom. Okay. He was going against the social conventions of the time that came from a misunderstanding of Deuteronomy. Now we can't base doctrine on type but the typological meaning of a eunuch must be brought into play, okay? In the book of Esther, you had Haggai the eunuch who typified the Holy Spirit in Esther's life, okay? He, he was, he was a, a, a guard or a custodian of the harem, okay? Uh, also, metaphorical use of the term eunuch, those who are eunuchs for the kingdom. I've known a missionary, a friend of mine named, uh, I can't say his surname because it wouldn't be wise, but David, American guy from Virginia, uh, close friend, haven't seen him in a long time, but a missionary to the Muslims. Okay. He could not bring a wife with him into that mission field and have a family where his life could potentially be at risk. In that sense, he was sexually dysfunctional, not biologically, not psychologically, but the Lord gave him the grace to be single for the sake of the ministry God called him to. Okay? This is what Jesus was alluding to when he says eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. I knew a nurse, a pediatric nurse in Africa, who was a medical missionary taking care of AIDS babies. She couldn't get married and have her own children because she was taking care of sometimes 30 or 40 babies who were dying at that time. This was before antiretrovirals. The Lord gave her the grace, okay? Now in Genesis, your desire shall be for man. That is linked inextricably to the maternal instinct, to the desire for pregnancy, desire for babies that women have, okay? The natural, biological, and psychological maternal instinct, the natural sexual drive and the desire for motherhood something that is natural was superseded by divine intervention okay superseded by divine intervention that's true of her and it is you know and it was true also of my friend david the natural biological drive is superseded by divine intervention for the sake of the gospel Okay, Jesus was using eunuch in that sense. Now, going back to why they couldn't come into the temple, all of the Levitical laws in the Deuteronomic legislation and the Deuteronomic 
laws, the statutes. They are all types of New Testament truth, of Christ, of the gospel, of Christianity. It's a shadow. It's a type. Okay? It's a shadow. It's a type. People are born biologically to reproduce. People are born biologically to reproduce. People are born again to reproduce. We are called to lead others to Christ. Those who do not do that are not being faithful witnesses. Not saying we're all called to be evangelists, but we are all called to evangelize. We're not all called to get on a platform and preach to a large group of people. But we are all called to share our faith and to witness. Not everybody can preach to a large group. Not everybody can fish with a net. Everyone, as I put it, can fish with a rod, with a pole. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. I thank God for the evangelists he's used over the centuries who preached to large groups of people in the tradition of, 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 of George Whitfield and John Wesley and all of that. I acknowledge that. Praise God for that. However, most people get saved, and most people have always gotten saved through the witness and testimony of an individual. <laughs> More people... More fish have been caught with rods than with nets, okay? The same as somebody is born to reproduce biologically. Someone is born again to reproduce spiritually. Those who are not doing it are not being faithful witnesses, thus their restriction from the temple. Remember, seven times the New Testament says that the church is the temple. The Levitical temple is the shadow of the church. That's a nutshell answer. I hope it clarifies it. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, another question from uh, Esther. Do you have a question? Yes, uh, I do. Um, getting back to the the sin issue with um, when we confess our sins, Jacob, I wanted to know if you could clarify we all have struggles. And Tell me about it. Thing about the struggles of past experience as opposed to not you conjuring up these thoughts, but the backflashes we, that we have. Yeah. I have them, you know, especially many of us that may have backslidden. Now, where, where does it... Where does it draw the line? In other words, that is sin. Is that, a, is that sin to be confessed? Is this something that we're battling and we're resisting? Okay. Because it's not physically open for people to see. We're not engaging in it. It's, yes. a, it's a mind battle. So it's easily concealed and people don't know about it. But I'm sure that everybody that's on this, this uh, you know, Bible study know that we are all made out of clay. We're yeah. all flesh. We all struggle. But where... So, so then you say unless that person repents and turns away and there's the fruit of repentance, but then we're struggling. So could you bring some okay. clarity on um, that? Well, I was afraid of saying too much today about my own struggles in that area, but you confirmed that I was not out of line to do it. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, are you the sister from Staten Island? Yes, yes. Oh, boy, you are a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> I was. A, a lot of that stuff I I'm told you about I did on South Beach and, and Staten Island in the shadow of the Verrazano Bridge in the middle of the night. But God, let's God. not go there. Yes, that's not. <laughs> all right. Look, uh, we all have two natures. Yes. We did what we did. We know what we know. Satan has a reservoir, an arsenal of weapons to use against us. Past sin. We have to understand something. Reckon. 
reckon yourself as dead. Now, reckoning yourself as dead has two aspects. The person who engaged in the sin, be it immorality, drugs, combination of whatever, is dead. I am not a former cocaine abuser. That poor loser is dead. After somebody has been executed, <laughs> you can't mm -hmm. hold them guilty. Okay. Yes, true. Nobody can nobody can say we have to hang John Wilkes Booth for shooting Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a done deal. The old nature died with Christ. Now, that means two things. First of all, it means we're no longer guilty of those things. Okay. The person who did it is dead and Christ paid the price. But the second thing it means is psychologically, and remember the battlefield is, is always in the mind with the spirit that who creates the battlefield is always the mind. Your mind, <laughs> my mind is a battlefield. The second meaning of we have been crucified with Christ we are dead, we are new creations, is this. The person who wants to do that stuff, the old man, the old woman, is now dead. Reckon yourself dead. I was thinking of this, thinking, look, we're always going to struggle with that stuff until Jesus comes. Another strategy of the devil is this. He will mentally bombard us with recollections of past sin, any kind of sin. He will mentally bombard us with recollections of it until mm -hmm. he gets us to think about it for all of two minutes or 30 seconds even. And then the condemnation comes. Aha, aha, aha. He's the accuser of the brethren or of the sisters. These are all his tactics. We have to remember, temptation is not sin. Recollection, being intellectually and cognizant of what we did, that's always going to be there, at least in this life. Okay, It's always going to be there. Like a, like a and, memory. And, and, and the memories give the devil ammunition. But it's temptation. Never confuse temptation with sin. Now, there's one other thing you mentioned that we talked about last week. The people who get into entire sanctification, ultra-holiness doctrines. I told the story of one I knew. Very nice guy. I like the guy now. Uh, good brother, but he had this idea that sin was not thought, word, and deed. It was only word and deed. <laughs> mm. So he thought he had sinless perfection because he didn't do this stuff. And no, if you think about it, you want to do it. Remember, if you lust after somebody's husband or somebody's wife, as far as God's concerned, you've slept with them. Covet. You know, thou shalt not covet. If you desire what is not yours, as far as God's concerned, you did it. But there's a, a line between temptation <coughs> and commission. <coughs> the Holy Spirit empowers us to stay on the right side of the line. <coughs> but you are never going to stop the devil from taking those things out of the memory bank that is for him an arsenal of temptation what you can rely on <coughs> is the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to empower you to have victory over it okay yeah I, I often think that Paul was haunted <coughs> by watching Stefan get stoned and, and things in his life sometimes when I'm reading um, in the book yeah. of Romans in the way and you know and I'm sure that we all battle with that it's just trying to decide 
when it's coming from you or it's coming from the devil bringing it. Yeah. And, you know, how long do you think about it before it's now a sin and you have to confess it? Yeah. You well, know, one, so time, one time Esther in Staten Island drove up Victory Boulevard in a stolen car, pulled a bank job in Port Richmond, Blue Town headed over to Gothel's Bridge to hide out in Jersey till the heat was off. And then she became a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. She tries to put it right. She gives the money back. <laughs> Turns herself in, hires a lawyer. And the lawyer says, this person realizes what she did was wrong. The police had no clues, no hopes of her own conviction. She turned herself in, and the district attorney or the prosecutor says, Your Honor, we ask the court for leniency in the sentencing. Hmm. Okay? The person who did that is dead. She's no longer alive. Whatever you did, it does. the person who did it is dead. Wait a minute. Thank you. Reckon yourself dead. And reckon yourself alive to Christ. That's the struggle. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Ole, you had a question? I can't hear him. Ole's in Denmark. Ole, you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Ule is the Moria rep in Denmark. Go ahead, Ule. Hello. Uh, well, I had a question regarding uh, John's epistle. But the last thing you said made me think about something. You have a friend that says that sin was only in word and deed. But uh, he should remember that the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual, yes, correct. So what do you think is also sin? <coughs> I think if you sin in thought, again, if you covet, it's as bad as stealing. <clears throat> That's if you right. covet your neighbor's wife, it's the same as adultery. That's what Jesus says also. Yes. <clears throat> but, um, because, the, because the law is spiritual, nobody can uh, get to heaven by keeping the law. Absolutely not. But the law shows us that we're condemned and that we can't get to heaven and that we need a savior. That's its purpose. <clears throat> That's right. But then I have something about the, the epistle of uh, John. Yes, it's, what? it's always confused me a little because it seems like he contradicts himself. <clears throat> Where? He says that if anybody says that he never sins, then, he, then the truth is not in him. <clears throat> and then another place he says that if we stay in Christ, we will never sin. Okay. We will is get that, to that. We will get is, to that. Is that because of uh, the two kinds of sin? It relates to that, but that's not the main explanation. The main explanation is as follows. We'll get to this, but in the Greek grammar... It's present continuous active. It doesn't mean who sins. The just man falls seven times a day and gets back up again. It means who continues in it, right. who continues living that way. Okay? okay. If somebody does something and they repent and get convicted, that's one thing. Dropping your cross is one thing. It's bad. It's wrong. But we all do it. Dropping your cross is one thing. Throwing your cross away and still pretending to be a Christian, that's another thing. That's the distinction. But when we get to those verses, we'll, we'll deal with them, okay? Um, I would suggest that anybody who's got that kind of question, read, uh, first, read uh, first John in the NASB, because I like the way he puts it. He says, Christians don't practice sin, they practice righteousness. That's correct. And I really like that translation because that gives a proper... That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, Another question? One Come more. Uh, Norman, you had a question. 
You have to unmute yourself, Norman. Is that better? That's better. Yeah. Um, if I do 85 miles an hour on the motorway <laughs> uh, on a Monday, and then I kill a policeman on a Tuesday, God sees both as sin. Is that accurate? or an untrue aspect of sin and the Bible? The Bible speaks about the fact that sin is sin. Two wrong things may be sin, but Jesus also said he has the greater sin. Some sins are more serious than others. Speeding on the motorway cannot be put or equated to killing a policeman. Sin is sin, but Jesus spoke of he has the greater sin, okay? Not all sin is co-equal in its seriousness, and we're not going to deal with it tonight, but John says the sin that does not lead unto death, but we'll put that when we get to it. We're not going to deal with it now, okay? There is greater sin and lesser sin. Now, unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church cooked up this doctrine of mortal sin and venial sin, which is nonsense. It's not that. But there is there is degrees of seriousness to sin. Yeah, exactly.